and welcome to Fiddly Fifi. We are here to encourage new houseplant owners and to inspire our existing houseplant collectors. We already, believe, we already believe that you have a green thumb. And in our little village, we aim to re-energize that green thumb and inspire you not only to grow houseplants, but to grow your own food. Now, no plant is an indoor plant. They all belong outside. So if we want to bring them in to live with us, we're going to have to create an environment where they can survive and thrive. And that includes having light, that includes having water, and possibly feeding them and creating a moist space, not a dry space. You know when we put our air conditioning or heater on, it creates dryness. Outside they have humidity. So we want to create a good environment so these plants will survive. For that reason, you have to know a little bit of information about these plants. You want to know where they come from. So when you go to a store and you buy a plant, usually somewhere inside of the soil, there's gonna be a little card, whether it's a little thin card or a card like this. This card has information about the plant specifically. It will have a name, which will be a scientific name, and then it will have a common name, okay? So it will also, on the back of that card, tell you about the lighting, tell you about the feeding, and tell you about propagation and possibly moisture that this plant needs. So this is very important when you buy a plant. Why do you wanna know the name? Because you wanna know what type of plant it is and what type of plant it's from. For example, this is a fiddle leaf fig. It grows in the plains of Africa. It's not gonna need the same exact light source as a plant like this, with, which grows in a rainforest. So this is why this is important for you to know the name of the plant. So today I'm gonna to introduce you to one of the most common house plants. It's the easiest to find, it's the most inexpensive, it's the easiest to maintain and grow, and this is the Epipremnum aureum. So like I said, you have that scientific name, but who's got, a time to, who's got time to be bothered with that scientific name? So we just call these pothos, and some people call them the devil's ivy. Now that doesn't mean they're evil, okay? It's called the devil's ivy because some of these plants can be invasive species. And what that means, what that means was when it's an invasive species, what that means is that it will grow and grow and continue until it virtually can take over the landscape. So that's why they call it the devil's ivy. But because it grows like that, I think it's a great house plant for beginners because it's very easy to maintain, it will grow, almost no matter what you do to it. So it's very easy to take care of. And this is the pothos. So I brought up quite a few varieties for you to look at today. I think I have six or seven varieties. Before that, I wanna talk about a couple of terms that I'm gonna be using throughout this video and I wanna make sure you're familiar with it. So one of the terms is foliage. When I refer to foliage, that just refers to the leaf of a plant or a tree. So when I say foliage, I'm just talking about the leaves, okay? When I say the word variegation, variegation refers to any type of design or pattern that's on the leaves. So this is a plain green leaf. This has a pattern, so it has variegation. So we have foliage and we have variegation. The third term I'm gonna use is propagation. So propagation is a way to breed your plants, which is not chemical or scientific. It's just very natural process by which we can take a part of this parent plant and we can make a new plant. So I'm gonna talk about all of that today, today with reference to the Epipremnum aureum, or the pothos, or the devil's ivy. So if you tell me you've never seen a pothos, I'm gonna say you've never been outside. The reason why I say that, these are in your dentist's office. They're at your auntie's house. They're at the food court in the mall. They are everywhere. You can buy them from Home Depot. You can buy them from Walmart. You can even buy it from Kroger. They're everywhere. So the most common of these is the golden pothos. And the reason why this is called the golden pothos is because on these leaves, you will see a pale yellow or golden variegation. This is the most common, okay? You're gonna find this everywhere, super easy to grow. So let me show you some of the other varieties. So while we have the golden pothos here, this is also a golden pothos. As you can see, the reason why I call this trailing or vining if you allow them to grow, they will grow down and they will continue and continue. You see India here, this is my plant India. I named my plants, I'll tell you why later. But India here is trailing and just leaving miles and miles of leaves and vines, okay? So you can have it trailing. In the wild, these climb trees, believe it or not. And when they climb trees, they will trail up. The higher they go up, the bigger the leaves. 
So that's the golden pothos. That's the most common, and we'll talk about care, but this is one you'll find anywhere, super easy. The next one here that I have is called a Yesenia, or some people say Jesenia. This one is more of a very uh, striking green, and it does have a small amount of variegation, but you can't see it as much as you can see, as, you, as much as you can see some of these other variegated leaves. So that's the Yesenia. This is a neon pothos. Why do they call it neon? Well, hello. It's bright green. I love this. You're gonna hear me say this is my favorite plant about every single plant, okay? That's just what I do. But this is one of my favorites because I love this neon green. It's very striking, it's very beautiful, and it doesn't even look real sometimes. And you can see this also trails and has the vining qualities. So here we're gonna move on to the Marble Queen. This is a sought after variety. This variety is a little more difficult to find, but it's still not difficult. You can find it in most of your big box stores. When I say big box stores, I'm referring to Home Depot, Lowe's, those type of stores and not private nurseries, okay? But you can find this almost anywhere. The difference with this one is the leaves are a little bit larger and this variegation, let me pull one of these leaves out so you can see, it's almost like spotted. And some of these leaves look hand painted, as you can see there. And they have more of the white as opposed to the golden pothos, which has that pale yellow, golden kind of color. So this is the Marble Queen. In addition to that, we have the Cebu Blue. I love this because it's just so different. And it has like a blue hue to it. I don't know if the camera is going to be able to show, but it has a completely different leaf shape. And sometimes it looks silver, sometimes it looks blue, and it's also a very thin vine, like a delicate vine. I love this one. Well, I said that about everything, but I actually love this one just because of the way it looks so different, but it's still part of the Epipremnum family. Okay, right here we have a silver pothos. Um, sometimes they call them silvery and this has not only a different leaf shape and a different variegation, but this one has a different texture. It's very silky, it's very soft, um, and it also vines. This is a small one, this is one of my little babies. So this is the silver pothos. So these are the different varieties that I brought for you today. I wanna show you also, this here is, this one here, it's called a philodendron Brazil. And I brought this one because like the pothos, it trails. It also has some heart-shaped leaves. So sometimes people confuse these with the pothos. So the way that you tell the difference that on these vines, when a new leaf comes in, it has a very thin little, let me find a better one for you, a very thin little, little sheath. This is called a leaf sheath. And that protects the new leaf until it's strong enough to be on its own, and then those will fall off. So you're not gonna see these leaf sheets on any of these pothos. So although you see these and they look alike, it's a completely different plant, and I wanted to share that with you. I wanted to share that with you so you don't make the same mistake. So now we can talk about parts of this plant. On all of these, plant, on all of these plants, although there are different varieties of the plant, they have the same anatomy and the same leaf structure. So let me show you a little bit about this leaf structure. Just gonna take this marble queen, <laughs> just gonna take this marble queen out of the way for a second. And I have a plant that's a little more sparse so that you can see. Inside each of these plants, you will see these stems. And on each of these stems, they have what are called leaf nodes. So these nodes are these little bumps where you will see new leaves pop out. Okay, so each one of these plants, whether it's the neon, it has those same leaf nodes. And if you can see very closely, it looks like a little bump there. And those will form aerial roots. Those aerial roots are like little climbers and they'll grab onto the tree and that's how they climb up the tree. So those aerial roots can also be placed into soil or into water to create a new plant. That is called propagation. So. Each one of these has those same nodes. Let me show you. Even on the Cebu Blue, we have nodes. And you can see this little brown here. Those are going to be the aerial roots. 
Why are those important? That's what we're going to use to propagate or breed and make new plants. So the most important thing you want to know about those, about the breeding, is once we take pieces of these plants, those plants are called cuttings. If you want a nice full plant, you can see that this plant, I call it ashy because it look a little, you know, <laughs> sparse. It's not as full and pretty and thick and voluptuous as these. Well, because when you take those cuttings and you want to put them in soil, you need quite a few cuttings to make it lush and beautiful like these are. So this only has a few cuttings in there, but if you want to have tons and tons of cuttings and make it look really full and really, really pretty like this, you need to take a lot of cuttings. So I'm going to pause for a moment so I don't have a heart attack as I sacrifice one of my babies to teach you about propagation. <sighs> Bear with me. So I'm gonna take one of the vines off this little guy and I'm just gonna use some very clean scissors. You can use shears, you can use clippers for your plants. I'm just using some scissors today. You can use a razor, whatever you'd like. Oh my God. All right, so off we go. Sorry, guy. So now we have one of these vines and it has all of these nodes that we were talking about earlier. So we're gonna take this and we're, I'm gonna show you how to cut it. And from this, we can have a whole new plant. They usually take maybe two to three weeks for it to grow back, sometimes a little bit more in soil. So two ways you can propagate, you can propagate in water or you can propagate directly in soil. So I'm gonna show you this small cutting that I propagated several weeks ago, and I propagated this in soil, obviously. We're sacrificing a lot of plants today. So let me tell you, if you've ever murdered a plant, I murdered aloe before, so don't worry. This is the perfect rehab for you, okay? Because these plants will grow no matter what you do. So now I have roots. It started out, at this, started out as that little aerial root, and now it has full-blown roots and this will become another plant, or it already is another plant. However, as I said, if you wanna have a nice full plant, we need several of these to get going. So what we're gonna do with this vine that we cut, you're going to cut right below the node, and you're gonna keep the rest of that part of the plant. So we're gonna cut here, and now we have one node there ready to be planted. So we'll just go down the vine and underneath the node, right under there, we're gonna just continue to cut until we have several cuttings. And once again, these are called cuttings. Don't be afraid of hurting the plant. I mean, you can't really hurt it. Now, I will tell you, being very eager to water, when I first started collecting plants, oh, I just wanted to water them every 15 minutes. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, back off, it doesn't rain every day. Leave them alone. But I was so excited. So the, the worst thing you can do to this plant is overwater it. That means you don't have to water it every day. These plants actually like to dry out a bit. So I water them every week or maybe every other week. So a good way to tell if your plant needs water, you can do the down and dirty and you can just take your finger, your index finger, and you can just stick it right in the soil. And you wanna go down maybe half an inch, an inch. If it's dry and you pull it up and the dirt doesn't stick to your fingers, then it's time to water. If it still feels moist in there, leave it alone. If you overwater it, you will cause something called root rot. Once the roots have sat in water for an extended period of time, they will begin to rot away and you will lose your plant. How will you know? You will know because your plant talks to you, believe it or not. Now, if your plant is saying words, that's another show. But your plant will talk to you through colors and through texture. So, for example, this little yellow leaf tells me that there's been a little too much water. So yellow is usually for overwatering. Brown is for underwatering. So your plant will talk to you. Brown also could be sunburn. If it's too close to a light source, this one I had directly in front of a window, so you see that little brown sunburn. It's talking to me, it's not saying words, but it is talking to me and telling me that it had too much sun. So you don't want to overwater your plant. So now from that one vine, we have 
tons and tons of cuttings. So we can plant one of these individually, but of course we're not gonna have a very lush and beautiful plant. So one way to do it is with water propagation. We can take all of these. Now you see, instead of having this one little, as I call it, ashy plant, we've got a nice lush plant going here and roots are gonna develop right from these nodes. So I have an example of this right here. I planted these on 12, 12, 19. So I just stuck those in water. I, I actually wrapped mine in just like a, um, a zip tie, not too tight. And as you can see, I have roots. So these roots have already developed. So this, this is potential for a new, new plant. Now what I would do with this, when we have this guy that's really thin and sparse, I can just make a hole there and put this right in there and now I'm gonna have a very full and lush plant. This is called water propagation. So all you're gonna do is take all those cuttings that we just cut, sit them in clean water. It can be tap water, that's fine. Sit them in clean water and just let them sit. You wanna change the water maybe every other day or once a week or if you're busy like me, like every three weeks. But at least you want to try to change it and keep it clean, okay? But, you know, if you forget, I mean, what are you going to do? It's a cutting, like, it's a plant. It's going to live, all right? So this is water propagation. You're just going to sit this in the water. You're going to change the water every so often. And before you know it, you're going to have roots, and you're ready to plant them. I like, um, we're talking budget stuff here. So these come right from Dollar Tree or Family Dollar or Walmart super inexpensive, and they're cute. You can stick this on a shelf and it'll look nice in your house while you're waiting for it to grow. I actually like this because I can see the roots developing and I know, hey, it's time to put it in the soil. When you have them in soil, you can't see. The same goes for these cuttings. You can just take this cutting and make sure, make sure the node side is down and you can just put that right there in the soil and then we have to wait. We don't know what's going on, but we know that they're gonna root and eventually this is gonna adhere to the soil and become a plant, all right? Here's one more way. There's only two ways to propagate, but this is one of my secrets, all right? I'm just really messing with you, babe, but come on down. So, we have this one, which also does not have a tremendous amount of cuttings in there. There's only a few. That's why we only have a few vines, as opposed to India, who's got tons and tons, because there's so many cuttings in here. So we can add to this. Now, let me show you how I would do this. Again, we're gonna sacrifice one of these vines. This is actually one of the first plants I've ever had, so it's pretty old. And they can stay in this pot for years and years. So we're gonna take this vine. Sorry about my hair. We're gonna take this vine and I'm going to make sure, well, let me pause and let me take this out. And y'all can shoot this better when I take this out. Sorry. Ah, okay. All right, get rid of that. All right, so now you can see that in here we don't have that many cuttings in there. So what you'll wanna do is take this vine, make sure that the node side is down and we're gonna stick it in the soil and guess what we're gonna do? We're gonna take some good old fashioned hairpins. All right? The hairpins are gonna hold this plant in place while the node creates the root. So you're just gonna take your hairpin here, not too much so you're strangling the plant, but push it down in there significantly. And as we go around, we can just continue to do this until we fill up the plant. And now we're getting fuller plant in there. And this is just hair pins, okay? Not the bob pins, the ones that are flat, but you want the open ones like this. And we're just gonna go through and just push this down in the soil. And eventually, now when it was kind of sparse before, now it's filling up. So you see the plant getting fuller and fuller as we use those pins to hold this 
vine down. So there's a couple of ways you can make the plant look better. There's a couple of ways you can get new plants. So we already talked about water propagation. With this one, the same thing, that it looks so sparse. We can take this right from the water propagation or from the soil propagation and put this right into here. Another one of my personal tricks um, is that, oh, right here. So when you go to these big box stores, Lowe's, Home Depot, Walmart, all of those places, they'll sell very, they'll sell very small plants that are maybe $3.95, $4.95. Each one of these has cuttings in it. You can take a few of these small ones, get yourself a pot, combine them, and then you'll have a nice full plant just like this. So as opposed to um, just keeping this one, we're gonna keep our information card because that's most important. You can just take this, turn it over, and then we can just replant this. And we can replant these together. So instead of just having one, look how thick and pretty this is. So if you have five or six of these, you're gonna get a nice, full, healthy plant, just like India over here. And I told you before I was gonna share with you why I named my plants. Um, if you're a plant enthusiast, houseplant collector, you want to have a calendar. You want to keep track of your watering schedule. You want to keep track of your feeding schedule. You want to keep track of your trimming schedule. I wish that I could say that I do that, but I don't. But I want to, really bad, but I don't. I name my plants and it helps me. So this is Jerome. I'm going to remember that, oh, I forgot to feed Jerome. I gave India, who had that yellow leaf, I gave India too much water last week. She's not getting water this week. So that helps me and it personalizes the plant for me and it makes me want to take care of the plant. So that's another trick for you. Name your plants. Um, talk to your plants. If they talk back, we went over this. That's a whole other show. So make sure that you name your plants, personalize your plants so you can grow to love them. You guys are gonna grow together. You're gonna want to make sure that they don't get hurt, that they don't get pests, because pests are something else that will kill your plant. Little bugs, they're different kind of bugs. And on another show, we'll go over all the different types of pests, because you want to make sure that there are no pests inside your soil that can begin eating away and chewing your plant. Now, I want to talk about plants as it relates to them being toxic to your children or toxic to your pets. Most plants are toxic if they are ingested. If you have a toxic plant, which are some beautiful plants, the most beautiful ones usually are, you wanna put those on a higher shelf or you can have them hanging or however you can do, uh, whatever you can do to protect your small children or your pets. The way that they are toxic is by ingesting. If you are chewing your house plants, once again, this is a different show. As long as you're not chewing them, you should be fine. But small children and animals don't understand that. But for adults, they're not toxic just sitting here. Usually it's by ingestion. Or as, as in the example of the fiddle, when you cut it, they have blood or sap. And if you get that on your fingers, get that in your eyes, those are the ways that plants become toxic, not just because it's sitting here in your home. They're perfectly safe, okay? So I have shown you six different varieties of pothos, one of the easiest, most inexpensive, easiest to find, easiest to maintain, um, easy to grow, okay? You wanna water them maybe once a week, but again, what I want you to do is personalize the plants so that you know, so that you know what they need individually. One of the ways you can figure out if they need water, I explained to you using the finger method, which is just putting it in the soil and checking it. Another way, when a plant has enough water, it's usually gonna weigh a little bit more than it did when it's not. So when you pick up this plant and it feels super, super light, more than likely it's gonna need water. These plants like to dry out before you water them. So you're not gonna water them every day, okay? So you wanna be careful with the water because we, we don't want these plants sitting in water, all right? So make sure you check them either by the finger test, lifting them up, checking the weight. Also in stores, amazon.com, all these different places, they sell moisture meters. So uh, I don't have one here today, but they sell moisture meters. You can buy them. Maybe some of them are $5.99, some of them are 
It is a little computer. You can just sit it in the soil and it will tell you if it has enough moisture or if it's time to water. So those are the ways you know when it's time to water. As far as pothos, feeding them, you have the option to feed them or not to. I feed mine uh, because it helps them grow thicker and lusher. You wanna feed them maybe once a month during the growing season which is usually the summertime. And when it's wintertime, you wanna slow down on feeding them because in wintertime, the growth slows. You don't wanna be feeding it and it doesn't have the opportunity to grow and, um, and take care of itself with the nutrients you're providing. So make sure in the wintertime you slow down on the feeding and you're gonna slow down on the watering, okay? So this is the Epiprimnum aureum which is the pothos. We have again the golden, we have Yesenia, we have the neon pothos, we have the Cebu blue, we have the silver pothos right here. So ladies and gentlemen, you have been formally introduced to the Epiprimnum aureum. We are so grateful that you, that you tuned in to watch us and we hope you tune in next week to see what we have in store for you next week. Make sure that you embrace your green thumb. Let's get growing. We love you so much here at Fiddly Fifi and we mean it. <laughs>